again. Thank you all for being here with us today. It's a pleasure uh, to welcome you. And um, I am Emily Molinari, and I work for the International Peace Bureau. And we are very glad to host today's webinar about the presence of NATO and US bases in UK and in the Nordic countries. Uh, the event is organized by a group of very strong woman, women, the Global Women for Peace United Against NATO, which was formed last year and since then have, has been very, very active in raising awareness about concerning situations in the various parts of the world. You can find out more uh, on, the, on our website. I will send uh, the link then in, in the chat. And also on the website, you will find a declaration for peace translated into more than 25 languages, demanding a world without NATO and militarization. So please, if you haven't done that yet, sign the declaration and help us spread it around. And as mentioned, the event is supported by, by the International Peace Bureau, by us, and also by the network Not to War, Not to NATO, uh, by Massachusetts Peace Action, uh, Code Pink, UNAC, Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, US Section, and World Beyond War. And uh, in the next hour, we will hear six uh, presentations. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes, and then we will have some space at the end for questions, comment, and uh, yeah, we will have a more interactive uh, um, session. And um, as mentioned, the session is being recorded, and then we will publish and, and share it for the people that couldn't attend today. And um, before introducing, introducing all the speakers, I would like to briefly pass the word to our executive director, Sean Connor, for some introductory remarks and greetings. Thank you, Emily, and, and thank you for the invitation uh, to provide some introductory words here. Uh, it's great to be with you all today. Um, just to start, we know that NATO is the largest military alliance by far, accounting for over 55% of global military spending, according to the most recent figures released in 2022. Despite its origins in the Cold War, it has taken on completely new meanings in the post-Cold War context, uh, including, of course, expansion throughout Eastern Europe, despite caution from, among others, military generals, uh, experts, diplomats, academics, and beyond. Uh, it's been involved uh, in Bosnia, Libya, the, all the way through the current war in Ukraine, uh, showing that its activities stretch far beyond its supposed mandate, mandates excuse me, as a defensive alliance. Uh, seemingly, uh, the formation that they're creating is uh, now this us versus them, as they like to call it, democracy versus autocracy, or good guys versus bad guys painting a very black and white picture of polarization of you're either with us as NATO or you're against us. Uh, and in their efforts to expand and define this new omnipresent NATO, uh, they've developed international connections through global partnerships in many different parts of the world, including, of course, in Colombia, where it has provided arms and trainings for the army against the guerrilla groups in the country, which have committed atrocities following these trainings. Of course, also in the Asia Pacific context, including among others, Australia, South Korea, and Japan, uh, in the increasing preparations for a future war with China uh, through joint military exercises, as well as related alliances, including AUKUS, which is Australia, US, and the UK, and the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, which includes Japan, Australia, and India. They also, through NATO, have what they call the Mediterranean Dialogue and the Istanbul Cooperative Initiative, two processes in the Middle East. Uh, and these partnerships are, among other listed intentions, to enhance support for NATO-led missions and operations and build, quote-unquote, confidence in the alliance, uh, preparing several possible partners, if they qualify, for NATO membership one day, uh, and to promote reforms or changes within the societies of these partners. Uh, NATO's reach and activities under the guise of diplomacy translate to a U.S.-dominated system that relies less on actual international multilateral diplomacy uh, and diplomacy with our adversaries uh, to instead 
create an approach that focuses primarily on militarized solutions to conflicts, including to issues such as the climate crisis, and prepare for future wars, as uh, briefly mentioned earlier, the case with China. Uh, in the Nordic countries in particular, there is a strong history of being uh, diplomatic bridges uh, between adversaries. Of course, during the Cold War in particular, uh, we have uh, Helsinki in 1975, the Olaf Palma International Commission in 1982. Uh, Finland was a neutral country up until the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Now, with these countries falling in line with NATO and becoming a greater fulfilling a greater role in the militarization process of the region, there is a much greater risk of a great war confrontation and less mediators that could resolve and reduce tensions in the area and provide a moral and non-militarized uh, common ground for <coughs> diplomatic efforts to push together alternatives to military action and wars. There are at least 750 U.S. military bases in at least 800, or excuse me, 80 countries around the globe uh, most likely many, many more, and there are some great groups that are doing uh, studies to uncover all of these military bases. Uh, and this surpasses by far any other nation on the planet. While many of them may not be directly tied to NATO, of course, the implications are quite clear that this is a global alliance, a militarized global alliance that is pursuing a certain world order in a certain way that is more beneficial to some than others, and these military bases also play a, a very large role in this. But of course, there's also groups around the world that are putting up resistance to the continuation of U.S. and NATO-dominated system on the international level and presenting alternatives. Thankfully, today we have a great opportunity to hear from some of the leaders of these different movements in the Nordic region and the U.K., so thank you again for being with us, and I'm very excited to hear what our speakers have to say. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sean, for these introductory remarks, and yeah, the numbers always are helpful to get a better understanding of what's going on. And yeah, it's also true. We will hear now uh, also not only about the problem, but hopefully also about what we can do. So I'm also looking forward to, to our uh, present to our speakers and that's why we will start now uh, the first speaker um, will be Sophie Bolt she is the vice chair of the campaign of, for nuclear Dis disarmament CND and a long-standing peace campaigner she has represented CND in Japan for the 60th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in China for the 2008 Asia Europe Peace Forum the, two, the 2022 anti-NATO peace summit in Madrid and actions in Bruxelles last year. And Sophie will describe to us the current situation in UK where the British government is pushing the fear-mongering agenda of a pre-war situation in which Britain must prepare to wage war against Russia, Iran, China, and the Yemen. But where on the side, um, on the other side, the greater public awareness of Lake and Heath is mobilizing opposition. So please, Sophie, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thanks. And um, I hope I hope my um, my internet is a bit unstable. So I hope that I stay with you. Um, if it's going a bit funny, I might just have to stop my video. But um, it... oh, maybe it's already there. Is Sophie, can you hear us? Oh, that's a bit inconvenient. Uh, yeah, I think we just lost her. Um, maybe my suggestion would be, if that's okay for with you, we will wait for Sophie. Maybe she will come back and then we can move to the to the second speaker for, for now. I'm I'm here. Can you hear me? Oh, you're back. Okay, amazing. I'm yeah. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. No, Thank don't worry. You. Yeah, let's see if it works. Yeah, if go. not, you can you can turn off the camera. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Um yeah, so I was just sort of saying in terms of there's been sort of speculation that a Trump victory in November 
would see a reversal of of the US's like nuclear build up across Europe. But he's made clear, as like we all knew this, um, that if he's elected, um, the US will not be pulling its nuclear weapons out of Europe. But he's just used it to sort of repeat his calls for members to increase defence spending commitments. Um, and this is in a situation where like NATO spending across Europe is at an unprecedented level. Um, now, whilst NATO is not sort of formally engaged in supporting the genocidal war um, on Gaza, many NATO states um, are involved and, and, you know, the role of the US is absolutely central in terms of arming and funding Israel and vetoing every ceasefire vote um, in the UN. Um, so it's no surprise that um, NATO General Secretary um, Secretary General um, Stoltenberg made clear from the outset that um, Israel does not stand alone. Um, I mean, the situation is just absolutely horrific. Um, you know, every day there is um, another atrocity. Um, we've got, you know, starving people being um, murdered as they queue for food. And the UN agencies are all saying now that the population are experiencing famine you know, in this in these disease ridden camps. So it's it's some sort of sick joke when you've got Biden, you know, talking about building a, a port while hundreds of trucks laden with aid um have been held at Gaza's borders for, for weeks. Um and we know that last month um the US bombed bases in Syria and Iraq, supposedly, you know, um aimed at those, you know, with links to Iran. Um, but what looks like actually an attempt, you know, is this an attempt by the US to draw in Iran and Iraq into um, a direct conflict? So it's a very, very dangerous situation. And um, and while like the global north has been completely complicit in genocide, it's been the global south has been leading all the attempts to stop it in terms of, you know, the votes around the, the UN the landmark vote supporting South Africa's case of genocide against Israel at the International Court of Justice. Um, and, you know, and now I think it's, I'm sure we're all welcoming the fact that the NATO member of Canada has voted to halt arms sales to Israel. You know, this is very late in the day, but it's 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 very significant nonetheless. Um, and we, you know, we need we need it to be moving in that direction. In terms of the situation in Britain, I mean, Britain has just given total backing to to the genocidal war on the Palestinians, rather than working to secure a ceasefire. It's just continued to arm Israel, and it joined the U.S.'s coalition with the absurd name, the Operation Prosperity Guardian, um, to like to you know to launch attacks on the the. Houthis were, that were blockading are still are blockading um, the Red Sea and obviously this Red Sea that the sorry the blockade um, has, in, has been initiated to try and stop the ceasefire and who else joined this Operation Prosperity Guardian key NATO allies you know along with the US it was Denmark Netherlands and Greece um, in Britain support for a ceasefire is increasing um, it's now at sixty nine percent. It was fought fifty nine percent in in November, so that's that's gone up by ten percent, um, and sixty six percent of the population believe that Israel should enter into peace negotiations with Hamas. Um, the Conservative government is absolutely desperate to demonise um, the peace protesters and is redefining the definition of extremism to isolate the Muslim community. Um, and facing um, a defeat in the general election later this year, the government is again desperate to remain the um, number one ally to the US. So it's pushing this fear mongering agenda of a pre-war situation in which Britain must prepare to wage war, all out war against Russia, Iran, China, the Yemen, you know, everybody. And so we're finding that the US plans to site um, B-6112 um, nuclear bombs at Lake and Heath are now being framed in the media as part of this like huge push for in even more increased military spending. There are talks around uh, conscription, all to defend a militarily weak um, Britain. But of course, you know, we know this is complete rubbish. You know, the, US, uh, the UK has like the fourth biggest military spending in the world. 
you know, it's got a completely aggressive foreign policy, spending billions, you know, sending billions in, in aid to Ukraine in terms of military aid. And of course, it's increasing its nuclear arsenal by 40%. Um, and it's the expansion of, of Lake and Heath, which is the key base in terms of the NATO expansion, um, is accelerating. Um, in August last year, the Federation of American Scientists uncovered um, that uh, there was a US Air Force document. This is the only way that we can get hold of any of this information. It's like, you know, sort of detective work. To, uh, referring so this document was referring to a contract for um 144 bed dormitory for additional u.s personnel to participate in a potential what they called surety mission um which we know you know surety is like this sort of jargon for um for nuclear weapons um so in response to this uh cnd launched a legal challenge um basically in order to put the spotlight on Lake and Heath, and also to pressure the Ministry of Defence to provide transparent information about what is the purpose of the development, i.e. to come clean, that it's about nuclear weapons. So we've argued that there needs to be an environmental assessment made before this new building work can go ahead. Um, the MOD, you know, because basically we want to say, we're saying like, how on earth can nuclear weapons be environmentally um, safe? You know how can they how can they be um, environmentally friendly? Um, and the MOD, of course, are sort of saying that um, the development won't lead to any um, significant environmental damage. Um, so yeah, so that's a that's but that's getting a lot of media coverage for us here. Um, and then we also know that another new development is um, there have been new contracts to install ballistic protection sites at Lake and Heath, which are designed to protect troops from strikes on high level assets. Um, again, another reference to nuclear weapons. Um, so we, you know, um, and finally, I suppose really to make it to make it clear how significant this British base is to NATO plans. Um, there was a high level visit um, of the US Deputy Defence Secretary Kathleen Hicks that took place last year. Um, we know in terms of the time scale around when are these when are these bombs going to be delivered across Europe? Um, the US has already deployed them to bases in the States. Um, and we know that there are plans to deploy them across Europe by the end of 2025. So it's this year and possibly going into um, into um, the first half of next year. So, you know, I don't know about like, you know, that it'll be good to, to get sort of feedback from others here. But, you know, that's a time scale that we're, that we're looking at. Um, and then just finally to look at the kind of opposition to the developments, opposition to NATO and, pub and public awareness. Um, so as well as holding like national protests at the base, um, calling on the government to refuse delivery of the US bombs, um, CND's organized um citizens' weapons inspection stunts at the at the at the base, and that secured really good kind of regional coverage. Um CND also organized an action at the base which was filmed for the British state television's um prestigious um documentary series called it's panorama which is prestigious but it's also can be quite reactionary so we weren't sure what you know how what the coverage was going to be like um but the documentary um was called nuclear armageddon um how close are we um and that aired in advance of the doomsday clock um announcement in january um and the documentary kind of makes an assessment of the latest nuclear threats um, and it spotlights um, US plans to site um, these new nuclear bombs at, at Lake and Heath. Um, and it was, I think it was really important that we were part of that documentary because I feel like we were the sort of really the only voices that were actually sort of saying, look, you know, look what the US are sort of doing in terms of, of um, developing um, new nuclear weapons and, and um, really ratcheting up the pressure across Europe. Um, the, that that documentary is still available. Um, I'll put um, the link in the chat if anybody's interested. Um, it is interesting just in terms of like the kind of level of, of like um, coverage we're getting for our, our kind of um, opposition. So because of this higher profile of the campaign, 
Um, this means that we're getting like a lot more activity focused um, on the base from a whole from the whole kind of breadth of the piece and that anti nuclear movement, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, so we're um, we're going to be having regional action um, at the base in May. Um, we're planning um, to make it an issue in the local elections here um, in May, um, especially around the base, but also in the national elections in autumn. You know, basically, we want to be securing uh, commitments from candidates to oppose um, U.S. nuclear weapons um, coming to Britain again. Um, and we've also got uh, a women's peace camp planned uh, for June. Um, and this is going, to, is going to be including women who were like centrally involved in the women's peace camp at Greenham Common. So people like Angie Zelter, um, uh, she's calling on women, you know, you know, to to come to that peace camp from across the world. So I think like um, Anne Wright is planning to come. So that will be amazing. Um, and then just finally, obviously, we're also going to be focusing on the actions around the NATO summit and the anti-NATO summit um, and, you know, the 75th anniversary in July. So we'll you know be doing something um, in Britain and maybe if we can, a small delegation of us will be coming over to the States. Um, so that's it from me. Um, thanks very much again for organising this and really looking forward to all the amazing contributions to follow. Thanks. Amazing. Thank you so much, Sophia. You were right on the spot with the timing. Perfect. Um, I don't want to take too much time between the speakers. We will, as said, we will address all the questions and comments at the end of the presentations. Uh, so let's just move on to the second speaker of today's session, uh, which is Ingeborg uh, Bryans. She has worked in the Norwegian National Con Council for Innovation in Education was Secretary General of the National Commission for UNESCO before joining UNESCO headquarters, where she served as Special Advisor on Women gen and Gender and as Director of the Women and the Culture of Peace Program, before becoming Director of the UNESCO Office in Islamabad and the Liaison Office in Geneva. Uh, moreover, from 2006 to 2016, she was on the board of the International Peace Bureau and last and the last seven years, she was also the co-president. So dear Ingeborg, thank you uh, for being here and you can start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Dear friends, when we spoke uh, of the militarization in the Arctic July 2023, the theme was NATO's northern expansion and circling of Russia, consequences and threats. And today, we are concentrating on NATO and US bases in the UK and in the Nordic countries. And we can state already at the outset that the situation has become dramatically worse, with also Sweden and Finland becoming members of NATO, and with an enormous expansion of US bases or so-called joint areas in the Nordic countries with the present goal of 44 bases. With these bases, US would be able to attack Russia next door with nuclear weapons without the knowledge of the Nordic countries. As for Norway, this is happening in blatant disregard of the previous policy of having neither foreign bases nor nuclear weapons on Norwegian soil in times of peace and in disregard of paragraph one of the constitution guaranteeing Norwegian sovereignty. This ongoing heavy militarization of the Arctic will provide not more security as proclaimed by the government, but less. The escalation is also seen as a serious and additional threat to Russian security. If the Russian president's main security concern is to keep NATO away from the Russian border, he has indeed obtained the opposite. The Nordic countries have, through this process, become part of the global network of US bases, considered to be between 800,000 in almost half of the countries of the world. For comparison, Russia is supposed to have eight and China won. In a short time, nearly without debate, the Nordic defense has been Americanized. Besides, the American military 
is a tremendous polluter and the bases are env environmentally disastrous. They may be harboring nuclear weapons, they are not under national law and protection, but under US dominance. International law, as developed by the UN, is replaced by the so-called rules-based order, profiting the Western big powers, whether countries or multilaterals, multinationals, sorry. Norway has for many years considered to be the eyes and the ears of NATO in the North, which in practical terms means sharing vital military information with the US government. A potential war between US and Russia risks to play, be played out on Norwegian and Nordic soil. People, to the extent that they are informed, are bewildered as to what is NATO and what is the US. The confusion created is probably deliberate. The public has over time been led to think that NATO is essential for Norwegian security. With the uncertainties and a dramatic decline in US democracy, people might well have been much more skeptical to these new bases if they knew they were based on bilateral agreements between the US and Norway as initiated by the US, with no other link to NATO than the fact that NATO is almost totally controlled by the US. Norway has previously been of the view that a friendly country with good internal welfare systems, solidarity with the poor and generous foreign development aid, as well as strong support for the UN would be the best security guarantee. Now, with the NATO and Stoltenberg effect on the Norwegian government and his native country, the majority, at least as expressed by politicians, media and many academics, seem to think that peace necessitates military might and even more little weapons. Membership in the North Atlantic Treaty was until recently a political divisive issue in Norway between the traditionally pro-military and capitalistic right-wing parties and the social democrats on one side and the more progressive left on the other. The fact that most people in Norway are against nuclear weapons does not however seem to stop their support for an oversized military alliance based on nuclear strategies and with the first use doctrine. And no one as for so far is asking for a referendum, nor insists that the policy of no to foreign bases and no to nuclear weapons on Norwegian soil be integrated into the Norwegian constitution. The US is in fact braving or occupying parts of Norway almost to full applause. The US was granted four new so-called joint areas in Norway in 23, and recently the, the government has allowed eight new ones. The, the decision will be rubber stamped by parliament this spring. This comes in addition to the sophisticated American military installations of surveillance and spy facilities in the air, on the land, in the sea, that the Norwegian government has already allowed for years. These decisions have to a very limited degree been known to the public, perhaps not even to the majority of parliamentarians. The effects of the new and extended agreement of military cooperation between the US and Norway is of course, of very high concern to the peace movement. Militarism is in fact the black hole of democracy, also in our countries ranking on top of the global successful democracy list. The government has also allowed allied nuclear submarines into two Norwegian harbors in Bergen and Tromsø. NATO and US military exercises are much more frequent bigger and closer to the Russian border than ever before. We have just had 20,000 soldiers training on the potential war with Russia on North Norwegian ground. 
Nordic Response 2024, was part of the NATO Steadfast Defender with 90,000 soldiers, as well as to the British-led naval exercise Joint Warrior. These exercises show full disregard for the huge cod fisheries that take place at the coast in the north exactly at this time, as well as the ongoing transfer of reindeers from inland winter pastures to coastal spring pastures. The war games interrupts and threatens both local and indigenous food security and survival. There are many reasons for looking more carefully at what is happening in the far north. The Arctic is presently attracting huge international interest as the global warming and the melting of the ice open up for more fisheries, more drilling of oil and gas, and extractions of minerals from the seabed, and not least, allow for new and efficient transportation routes notably in the Northeast Passage, with new possibilities for trading between the West and the Far East. The location of the Arctic and this new situation with broader access to valuable natural resources adds to the tension and the already heavy militarization of the area. This happens in parallel with a very strong weakening of ordinary, friendly, cultural, diplomatic, and business relations between Norway and Russia. Norway almost fully participate in the US-EU sanctions. Russia is excluded from the very important Arctic Council, despite the fact that half of the Arctic belongs to Russia. A new Iron Curtain is established with detrimental efforts, effects not least on the important cooperation between the different indigenous groups, as well as for um, environmental protection and safety at sea. For many years, it was important to Norway to keep a certain balance between deterrence and reassurance in the dialogue with the Soviet Union and later with Russia. Now, we have to insist on a no to a militaristic definition of security. NATO must never replace the UN. Instead of the old patriarchal models of economic growth, militarism, competition and confrontation with warfare over welfare, which risk leading ultimately to apocalypse, we acutely need to strengthen our peace and disarmament processes, including eliminating nuclear weapons and instead build trust and international solidarity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ingeborg. There were really nice words after a really concerning describe, description of the situation in, in Norway. Thank you so much. And now we can move to the third speaker, uh, Tove Jensen. Uh, Tove is board member of the Peace Initiative in Denmark and active in the campaign Not U U.S. Bases in Denmark. Tove will present why American bases on the Danish soil and the military and foreign policy course in, man man in Denmark I'm sorry, are aggressive and dangerous for peace in the Nordic region. When you, when you want to start, Tove, the floor is yours. Oh, you're muted. Uh, Tove, we cannot hear you. You're muted still. You need to click on the microphone. It sh should be on your uh, left bottom side. Um... Emily, maybe you will uh, switch on the mic. I tried, yes, but she needs to accept the, the request. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Do you see the option? Over. 
det är en röd, en röd mikrofon som du må flytta. Yes, now. Yes, but you know, it wasn't a problem, but my photo disappeared and I couldn't hear or say. Yeah, that. don't worry. Sometimes, yeah. yeah, we have too many things open and yeah. it happened yeah. to everybody. Thank you. Now we can hear you. Yes, and um, I have a question because I want to take up my speech on my scam. Is it okay? I'm asking, is it okay for you? I, I didn't understand the question. Is that okay? If no uh, yes okay i'll i'll do it in another in another way just a minute no i thank I, you for, okay thank you for seeing me and hearing about what is going on in De in denmark and you have presented that uh, i'm a, a kind of a coordinator in a campaign no to us bases and no to US soldiers on Danish ground. Uh, and I'm a coordinator of the peace initiative in Denmark. And it's very, a lot of, uh, of peace movements, but not any parties. In Denmark, it's very difficult to get also left-wing parties uh, taking part in the peace movement. Um, but we have, um, in this initiative um, contributed cooperation with this space campaign. Uh, and um, we want to focus on the current ne negotiations between the United States and Denmark on the conclusion of an agreement that gives the United States access to Danish territory. Um, and um, we, we, we are, of this um, understanding that our that the Danish sovereignty will be um, uh, I don't know the English word and I I want to say to you I'm not accustomed to speak in Dane in English and when you are speaking too fast I have a problem but now I I'm starting my speech uh, as you know is Denmark currently negotiating with the United States on expanded and changed defense and military operation. A bilateral military agreement is being negotiated between USA and Denmark just now. In February 2022, an introduction was written to a change and for peace, risky defense cooperation for Denmark. Denmark entered into a bilateral defense agreement with the United States, a so-called DCA. And that's the problem for all the, the lands, the, the countries in the northern part of the world. Our prime minister, Mette Frederiksen, expressed the prelude to the agreement as follows. She's saying, already in 2090, when the United States reached out to Denmark and offered to expand Denmark's association with the United States, it was with the desire for a literal bilateral base agreement and the conclusion of the special defense agreement. The, ne the, <clears throat> the ne negotiations have been going on since 2019. We must assume they deal with discussions on conclusion of this space agreement uh, already for this years ago. The Defense Cooperation DCA will mean that Denmark will join the US space empire and open Denmark up for access to the possible dominance of foreign troops on Danish soil. About the purpose of the upcoming agreement, uh, DC-8 writes, about themselves. The United States welcomes the offer announced by Prime Minister Mette Frederiksen from the Social Democrats on February 22 to begin the negotiations on a new defense cooperation agreement. Once concluded, this agreement will allow our countries to deepen our close security partnership. 
I'm reading, I'm reading this because I am surprised when I, uh, when I read this, how many feelings for the good partnership and I haven't, um, I haven't seen this uh, good security partnership, uh, just uh, another, another um, yes, I don't know in Danish. Uh, further, now in this, in this context, now I will go on and be a, um, a bit more um, a bit more precise. Um, our alliances are a key source of American strength. The United States and Denmark work closely together on a wide range of issues that are important to both countries, to the NATO alliance and to the rest of the world. The opening of these consultations with Denmark reflects our commitment to reaffirming and revitalizing American alliances, alliances to address common security challenges while protecting common interests and well value. Such an agreement has been discussed and negotiated most recently with all the Nordic countries, as you have heard, but not for Fairerne and not for Greenland. The base campaign had a meeting with the Committee of, on defense, defense Minister, and we have put a number of questions to the Minister, and we got some answers. We are concluding that we are negotiating a bilateral agreement with the United States where unknown premises for cooperation can take place. It is not an enlargement of NATO membership, as you, as you have already mentioned, but will for us to be, to, to see, be a surrender of sovereignty, an incorporation into America's mighty base empire. These negotiations create great insecurity for those parts of the Danish public who are even aware of the independent of the impending agreement because the negotiation take place almost without publicity. How can the government and the parliament recommend signing an agreement which neglect and disregard an open democratic process when it comes to the security of the Danes. Therefore, we in, um, in peace uh, initiative call for transparency. Denmark, ha Denmark already has military cooperation with the United States and like the other, you, you will be here. Um, we call for the reason for the Danish need for this bilateral form of agreement with the world's largest war machine and its history over the past four decades. It hasn't been peace we have seen, but wars. Our defense minister reply, our, our questioning, refers to the extension of the so-called SOFA agreement, but it can only worry, worry us more than explain why bilateral agreements are concluded. The experience from that agreement was that when the United States was to leave Greenland and the United States forced them to stay in Greenland, when they were questioning about whether they have deposited nuclear weapon on the kingdom's land, Denmark received no answer, but it was there, they were atomic bombs, as history showed us. So the reference to, to this SOFA agreement uh, is that this agreement is only an extension and it means uh, that uh, the Danish submission to the United States will uh, be uh, strengthened. History for, from Greenland shows us that it will, it is and will continue to be the United States that makes the central decisions even if it takes place on Danish territory. Danish jurisdiction and sovereignty are being trampled underfoot. We were asking the minister, does the minister have the necessary confidence in the Pentagon 
in the successive American presidents when two basic principles of Denmark's foreign and security policy are overruled. And here they come. We are not accepting foreign bases on Danish territory, and there must be no clear, no nuclear weapons in Denmark. Denmark has not signed the UN Treaty Against Nuclear Weapon, but the public opinion are against atomic military installations and weapons on Danish ground. When the peace movement asked the minister and the government to be so much aware, uh, they were they, un they answered they they can assure that I quote uh, nothing is coming agreement in this coming agreement will change Danish politic in the question on Danish sovereignty and everything will happen in full respect for our for your sovereignty your laws and your practice and habitants. Finally, they says there would be no change in loading and deploying of atomic weapon or cluster bombs, example, as example on Danish ground. But we fear that in connection with the planned base agreement, we will see and hear Danish government regret, but break fundamental principles of Danish foreign and security policy. That they do not want foreign troops stationed nor advanced storage of other states' weapons on Danish territory, nor stairs of nuclear weapons. Um, in our opinion, the decision of the bilateral agreement requires a reading under section 22 of the Danish constitution, which would mean that a referendum with prior public debate would have to be held. We have already seen how the Nordic countries, like the 30 uh, countries in NATO, allow themselves to be pressured into aggressive foreign and security policy that requires rearmament to a degree that we have not seen in recent times. We need peace, not war. And today, we are asking our left-wing parties why they don't work actively to end the NATO alliance, with which has survived their purpose to fight against the Soviet Union 30 years ago. But the Soviet Union is history, and NATO should have been laid down together with the Warsaw Pact. Why didn't NATO? Why did NATO transform? trying to a worldwide aggressive power, which actively look, took part and in, initiated in military conflicts all over the world. NATO should have been eased in 1990s and new a peace agreement being arranged. Why have we been supporting US dominant role in Europe and in the world? Until now, they have made war not peace. NATO is, in our viewpoint, a relict from the Cold War and the past. It's a wake-up call what is going on in Ukraine and in Israel, Gaza. Thank you very much for the word. Thank you, Tove. Thank you for your speech. And uh, if you need any time to, that we repeat anything just just let us know and thank you also for doing that in english even though it's not uh yeah. that easy it's it yeah we really yeah yeah we really appreciate it thank you so much um now I would uh i would introduce you our uh, fourth speaker for today is uh, uh, which is karin utas karison Karin holds a PhD in peace education from Sweden, and she's a retired pediatrician teaching conflict resolution. Mm -hmm. She's on the board of Women for Peace in Sweden, coordinating a group of Nordic Peace Alliance. Karin will share about their campaign on organizing a referendum to stop the parliament from ratification of the Defense Cooperation Agreement, DCA, which is seen as even worse than NATO membership regarding loss of sovereignty. 
Karin, when you want, you can start your presentation and I'm going to show the map in one second. Thank, thank you very much for allowing me to come and tell about our situation here in Sweden. I agree with the tour. It's not so easy to, to speak in English and to follow also, I think. Uh, anyway, I am uh, happy to have this chance. I can uh, start by showing this map of how many um, US-Swedish uh, bases there uh, is supposed to be. Um, 17, and you see the red dots here. And you have 15 in Finland, um, 17 in Sweden, and now they used to have four in um, in uh, Norway, and uh, another eight are coming up now, as uh, Ingeborg said, and uh, around four, and some there are uh, drones and uh, harbors in Denmark, also. So all together. It's um, about 50 new uh, places for U U.S. troops and uh, um, and we weapons and uh, um, what's called uh, uh, where, where they uh, keep weapons, which also could be nuclear weapons. So we have no law in Sweden against nu against nuclear weapons, uh, and uh, we have not uh, uh, signed the TPNW um, the treaty on pro prohibition on the pro prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, because of um, um, how the US stressed our government government at that time actually i was star um, you can uh, take that away for the for a mo moment emily the the map and we'll uh, come back to it, I think, later on. Well, uh, as um, Tove said, the uh, these bases uh, they are the Swedish uh, um, uh, what's called regiment. Um, where, well, uh, exercise um, uh, grounds and also where we all have our uh, military. And uh, this will be divided uh, and um, the work together, and that will be secure parts. And this is what makes us feel they are US bases because Sweden will not be allowed to uh, to uh, uh, in uh, look in, 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 in I lose some words here in, inspect uh, to uh, look at has to see what are in these parts of the of the uh, of the place of the base uh, so it's all very secret but actually i think i should have started from the beginning um uh, we have in sweden joined uh, nato as you know uh, and got accepted on the 7th of March this year. Um, it, it actually, the I wanted to tell you about the, the impact of the invasion in Ukraine because uh, on the 24th of February in 2022, because this really made a change to us in Sweden. Uh, the Democrats changed uh, in a few weeks they moved from being anti-NATO to pro-NATO. And it all had to do with uh, the fear of Russia because of the invasion in, in uh, Ukraine and how the media uh, um, told us about it without any uh, understanding of the reasons for the publications before. Um, uh, before this and uh, what happened in, in Crimea and why uh, the, this thing happened in Crimea in, in 2014. Nothing about the, the, um, uh, the war inside um, uh, Ukraine. So we were, the S Swedish population 
has not been informed and still are more or less, well, they are more <laughs> brainwashed actually. So, um, and this uh, has made us all, uh, not me, of course, and mon not the peace movement, but there are also divisions within the peace movement, um, a split um, between those who believe in the Western narrative, which is very, very strong, and uh, another narrative which can see the, that this is a relationship between um, and uh, a power uh, struggle between uh, Russia and uh, and you uh, and you US. Anyway, so this uh, so social democrats changed or, or more or less overnight. Uh, and this le led to the application for membership um, in uh, uh, May already, 22. And the media has been very, very uh, pro uh, against uh, Russia and Russophobic. Um, uh, but now, uh, in in all in secret also, the the, the defense cooperation agreement has been. Uh, uh, negotiated and ended in signing uh, on the 5th of this December. So uh, the uh, uh, then it got um, official and not until uh, December 23 people came to know anything about it. So um, also parliamentarians actually and we have, we are trying to inform people to inspire against uh, this uh, lack of sovereignty. We we think this is extremely important that we have, will have no uh, right to um, to see what kind of weapons we get in into Sweden. They could be nuclear weapons, since uh, as you have heard here before the. U.S. Uh, they don't uh, answer questions whether they are nuclear weapons or not. So, and also uh, there is um, American jurisdiction. Um, so uh, the um, American soldiers and also their families will not uh, uh, be um, um, prosecuted in Sweden. Um, this uh, also this. Um, uh, treaty, the DCA uh, treaty is um, very uh, not so clear in all uh, writings. So you you don't really know exactly what will happen. And also, this is also about um, uh, um, uh, how they will uh, work, um, how they will cooperate within these bases. But it worries us a lot that there is secrecies, and we so we can't um, see what is happening. But it cannot happening there, and what they deploy, what weapons and uh, what, anything. Uh, so there, are, they have uh, very much to decide. Um, um, the, so. Uh, I think I'll go to this um, work we are doing now, a campaign for referendum referendum uh, uh, on uh, the, uh, the US basis. Um, this started on the 1st of, this, of March, and we think that we don't directly say no, although we who are working with this, uh, we 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 don't like this at all. We see it as very very dangerous and more uh, dangerous really than um, uh, membership in NATO. Since uh, here the U.S. will be able to decide uh, alone, and the, the Sweden is a small state. So uh, we think that also those people who have given up now or felt uh, sure even, many feel uh, less insecure within NATO, they could be with us in a campaign for referendum 
uh, for, for referendum, yes, because they don't uh, think it's right that we have not had an open discussion. The transparency that Tove was talking talking about is, is was nothing. Um, so even though, though people give up now that we are part of uh, the NATO, the NATO, we think that uh, they should still be able to say and work against this uh, um, 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 ratification that is going to, to take place maybe before maybe before the summer. Um, uh, it said that on the eighth of May. Um, the uh, treaty will come to the parliament and before that there are referral um, referral groups and also every person in sweden will or i mean a member of uh, swedish state can uh, write um, uh, uh, express what they think about the treaty and that that we do we tell People, then we we coordinate the work against the you uh, for the referendum and also, in a way, against the U.S. bases here and the uh, less of loss of security, uh, well, a security and sovereignty. So we uh, um, try to inform people and to. Uh, inspire people to learn about this but because they actually don't, don't know, learn, know at all. And also the parliamentarians don't know about this and they follow the, the leaders. And unfortunately, the Social Democrat leader is a lead, leading part. They are, um, they have decided now to be with NATO and be with, with US and uh, to be, be the conservative party. So we ha have a lot to do to, to tell people what it is all about. Um, we have a homepage and we are um, doing all these ordinary things, flyers, uh, uh, seminars, meetings, uh, demonstrations, uh, but we have a difficult time because the the peace move movement is very weak uh, and the media is very strong, very, very strong. But one thing has uh, improved after the, um, or not uh, this year so that uh, uh, they let us get into the newspapers a bit more. So we are not silenced as we used to be in the peace movement by the media. So that is something uh, to uh, take advantage of in our work to inform people about um, this DCA, what it means. And, and we don't go about against NATO so much because we want to show them that there is still a chance we can do some something about this. So I asked Agneta, uh, Agneta Norda here, uh, who is um, in the board of the uh, Global Network uh, for... Yes, I am here. No, you can't hear. No, sorry. The, against the uh, global net, she is in the board uh, uh, of global network against nuclear weapons and power in space. So uh, there are something very important things she wants to say, and it's got to do with the, also. I think we could have a look at the map again, uh, and to show you. Uh, the 70 bases, four of these are in the very north. Uh, can you put it uh, in? We'll see uh, that in the north, uh, you have Vidsel, it says Boden, Luleå, and Kiruna. Uh, and uh, this is also close to the Kola um, Peninsula, Mur Murmansk, where Russia have their uh, weapons. Uh, and you see there are a lot of red uh, dots in, in the north. North. Now I think you can take it away. Thank you, Emily, for showing the map again. But these, these are very big parts, um, areas. And um, there are Sama people and other people who live there. And they will be even more disturbed than before. 
And uh, actually, this are, uh, there are 109 organizations for uh, referral uh, to reply what they think about the treaty. And the Sama people, which are indigenous people of Sweden and Norway and, and Finland and Russia, uh, they are not um, informed at all. The other day, they didn't know about it even. So it's really terrible how they just <laughs> suppress us all. Anyway, um, Agneta Norberg wants us to, uh, to um, or and I do actually, tell you about the S range, which is far, not far from Kiruna, and it's the world's biggest downloading downloading station from satellites. The world's biggest downloading station for satellites. Uh, I'll just say a few, some things about this. Sweden has, in comparison with other countries, an impressive space technology industry and plays an important role in the European Space Agency, which headquarters is, uh, quarter is situated in Darmstadt, Germany. In the north of Sweden, the world's biggest downloading station from satellites is situated in range. It's not far from the city of Kiruna, but today the Swedish Space Corporation controls or monitors 24 satellites from this station. That means 92 satellite passages every 24 hours. The Space Corporation has made an alliance, an alliance with the US Space Corporation Universal Space Net. S-Range uh, was from the beginning presented as a civil project. It is, has close cooperation with Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Uh, and um, uh, Bruce Canyon uh, has, uh, is, according to Bruce, Bruce Canyon, all civil programs are covered from broad spy satellite military programs. Space, uh, Swedish Space Corporation operate uh, in space issues with the U.S., South Korea, India, Taiwan, Israel, and many other countries. There are all kinds of the of development which few know about. The latest latest is that S range will be able to launch mini satellites to destroy Russian and Chinese satellites in time of crisis. So uh, this is an, um, this important place is very important to U.S. So the uh, U.S. needs Sweden, and we don't need Sweden for defense. Um, there are also listening stations in uh, around Sto close to Stockholm and close to Gothenburg, and uh, the one close to Gothenburg is uh, Lerkil the British and you belong a third part to the British and the US five five eyes global um, spy agreement. So that is, we uh, download uh, inform information from the satellites and move, give it to um, the, um, the um, uh, in Great Britain and the US. And we are really helpful and have been, but uh, it's also important for U.S. to have Sweden uh, as an ally, much more than we need them, actually. And also, I'm worried about, uh, worried about the, the, the Baltic Sea, of course, uh, which they can uh, block um, uh, Russia. All, all together, it's terrible that we are uh, are uh, doing this actually to the world and to Russia and all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Karin. And yeah. Um, yeah, again, we all know how many topics and important issues we need to address, and that's preci precisely why we organize these kind of events and webinars so everyone can share their own perspective and priorities. So thank you all for yeah being here with us today and we will we will have a little bit of time at the end for the questions i saw that there are a couple in the chat already and i just want to tell to the speaker if you happen already to have some answers feel free also to use the chat so we can uh, try to address as many things as we can in the time we have 
but uh, I will now turn to uh, Ulla. <laughs> Ulla Klotze uh, is active in Women for Peace, Finland and in Global Women for Peace United Against NATO. She is a longtime activist for peace against nuclear power, advocating for sustainable development. She will inform us about Finland's context, given the fact that Finland became the 31st NATO member in April 2023. Um, Ulla, whenever you want, you can start and I'm sharing the presentation. Yes, please. Thank you, Emily. And hello, everybody. I'm very happy that we are here together and we cannot cover all the themes in one uh, evening. So we have to do more about this. Can you put the next uh, slide, please? Yes, as, as uh, Emily said, Finland became, unfortunately, the 31st NATO member in April 23. We had no open or honest debate about obligations and consequences. And the political elite, as Karin also said for Sweden, used the Ukraine war as a trigger. I think this was a trap for us and it was, it was deliberate. They had planned it for a long time. And exactly the same procedure was used for the DCA agreement. And our Prime Minister Orpo said about the DCA, it, it is a significant part of NATO. So it shows that it is a NATO thing also. And as you saw on the map, and you can put it now, uh, we will get 15 US military bases in Finland. Can you sh share? Yeah. And the, the unfortunate thing is that we happen to have a 1,300 kilometer border, direct border to Russia. Uh, and uh, that is quite significant. Uh, you can put the next slide, uh, Emily, because this we saw. The DCA in Finland was signed in December uh, last year, and the parliament has to ap approve it uh, this spring, and it will be a piece of cake. It will be just like 200 parliamentarians out of 200 voting yes. And, and it will be brought into force nationally in Finland by law and also by a government decree. And it opens, as in all the other Nordic countries, uh, Finnish land, sea and air forces areas for US presence, training, uh, defense material, soldiers permanently here, and uh, military personnel, easier movement, of course. Uh, and we can take the next one. Uh, yeah, and here you see the new border. This is the new NATO border, this long. This is the old border with the yellow, uh, yellow uh, border. And BBC News in April 23 said about Finland that NATO's border with Russia doubles as Finland joins. And this is not very good for us, but of course, uh, US is happy. Uh, and Newsweek in October 22 said also that as NATO member, Finland could have nuclear weapons 965 kilometers, that is 600 miles from Kremlin. I don't think Russia is very happy about this. You can put the next one. And um, there was a NATO meeting in Brussels in uh, January this year. And Latvia, you, you will see it on the map soon. Latvia, we, we have Finland, and below that in the Baltic Sea is Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. And Latvia's army chief said that the Baltic Sea immediately should be placed under NATO control. And he also said that the Baltic Sea should be closed for Russian ships. Mm. Can you put the next slide? And this is what he says. Here you have St. Petersburg. It's the second largest city in Russia with 5.5 million inhabitants, as much as Finland. Here you have Kaliningrad. It's a small uh, uh, enclave of Russia. I will come back to that later. And here you have the Atlantic Ocean, Denmark, Norway, Sweden. And if we close this one, mm -hmm. uh, the ships cannot go into St. Petersburg and they cannot go to Kaliningrad. So this was a real terrible provocation. Uh, you can put the next one. Here you see, uh, this is the Baltic Sea and up here is, is uh, St. Petersburg. Here you have this Russian enclave, uh, which has been there since the Second World War. And here you have the Suwalki Gap going from Lithuania into Poland. Here you have Belarus. And here the Russian enclave had 
train and 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 road transportation formerly to Belarus. Can you? It this enclave has four hundred and ninety thousand inhabitants. It's called the Kaliningrad Oblast. You can put the next one, Emily. Um, the Suvaki Gap, which I showed you, that's the border area between Poland and Lithuania, and it's it's narrow. It's approximately sixty five kilometers long and 155 kilometers wide. You have the miles in, in, in parentheses. And it's the only land link between Kaliningrad and the rest of Russia. And, and it's passing through EU and NATO members, that's Lithuania and Poland. And in June 22, due to the Ukraine war, Lithuania and EU imposed travel restrictions on Russian vehicles, preventing them to move across the gap into Belarus and, white, uh, and on to, to Russia. Uh, Lithuania removed it uh, because also the EU revised its its sanction recommendations in 23, and now it only applies to road transit, not to rail. There are a lot of restrictions uh, included in that, but I don't go into it now. But you see how crucial it is. Can you change the slide, please? And for years, uh, uh, this uh, uh, Suvalki corridor has been dubbed as not. NATO's Achilles heel. And this is why there are lots of NATO troops in this area, in, in Poland and in, in Lithuania. You can go on. So you see the fragility of the Baltic Sea. Um, and, and now US and allied uh, nuclear weapons are being introduced throughout the Nordic countries, not on land yet, but via operational naval units in our waters from the Baltic Sea to the Arctic Ocean, which uh, uh, Ingeborg mentioned. Uh, uh, the Arctic is becoming really, 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 really important because of the natural resources and the shipping and so on. And as we know, as Karin said and Tuve said, we don't know. Uh, in Australia, uh, the Secretary, Defense Department Secretary Moriarty said that we don't know. Uh, Australia has respect, respected the longstanding US policy of neither confirming nor denying the presence of nuclear weapons on particular platforms, whatever that means. We can continue, Emily. Uh, the Finnish Nuclear Energy Act prohibits import, manufacture, possession of nuclear uh, explosives and transports of nuclear weapons through Finland. And of course, the detonation in Finland. But the law amendment is already planned. The Finnish government has announced it and uh, the, the, the law will be reformed by 2026 at the latest. So mm -hmm. there will be all these restrictions taken off, I'm sure. Emily, next one. Uh, former PM uh, uh, Prime Minister Sanna Marin, who is the real NATO mannequin, was the NATO mannequin. He, here she is blessed by crossed hand Mr. Stoltenberg, said in my, May 22, I have not closed the door to any possible future decisions regarding Finland's NATO membership. So that also opens up for new nuclear weapons. Uh, the next one, uh, uh, Alexander Stubb, who became Finland's president uh, the 1st of March, he's a real uh, Stoltenberg fan. Uh, in, in the television debate before he was chosen, he, he praised Stoltenberg and NATO, and he said that Russia and Putin don't understand anything but force. And he said that without doubt, the nuclear deterrent we get from the United States increases our security. We will be blown up as the first ones if something happens, and the U.S. can sit there in peace and quiet at home and drink some wine or tea or whatever. And he said that the fact that Putin is afraid that we have them, that means nuclear weapons, and he knows that our legislation does not prevent it. He already said that the, the law has been changed, really, in, in this sentence is a deterrent in itself. He doesn't even wait for the for the law amendment. He is already stating it. And Stubb supports also allowing transit of nuclear weapons uh, through Finland, in Finland, over Finland. So please, Emily, go on. I tried to be fast because we have... Here you can see the two guys shaking hands. They were very happy together. Mm -hmm. Next one. Mm -hmm. uh, and and as Ingeborg said, or was it, yeah, Ingeborg and maybe Karin talked about the Steadfast Defender War Games, which are going on now from January to May with 19,000 troops from all 32 NATO countries. 
and up in the north we have uh, it takes place in all these countries and uh, next one and up in the north uh, we had this um, uh, uh, nordic uh, whatever uh, 24 here you can see the troops 90000 ships planes vehicles countries and here you have russia and they are really up here in the murmansk area where russia has its 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 nuclear fleet uh, and it's there are many different uh, uh, exercises being part of steadfast defender can you take the next one this is the nordic Rep response 24 which uh, uh, ingeborg mentioned here is alta uh, up in at the arctic sea and here you about where i am sitting you have the murmansk uh, uh, sh russian ships uh, so mm. and this was a part of the steadfast uh, defender and up here we had 13 nations uh, uh, practice uh, defending Na nato's northern flank as we are called next one please um i'm almost ready the business insider in january 24 they they quoted china's defense ministry that was ripping nato and he said that it's fair to say that NATO is like a walking war machine. Wherever it goes, there will be instability. And that has happened since it was uh, uh, formed and it will go on happening. Uh, can we take the last one? And I absolutely say that NATO must be dissolved, but this is the problem. The U.S. still has some 750, and as Sean said at the beginning, probably many more, in some 80 countries. And it was very, very clever of the U.S. to do this, because they have the NATO, but if for some funny reason the NATO would be dissolved, they would still have all the, 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 the bases all over the world mm. without NATO. So uh, this th this is a satanic plan, really. Mm. And um, uh, I have finished. But I, I I want to give the speech to the, the the speech to Oleg, who is a very very good friend of mine since the beginning of the nineties. We have fought many battles together, and I'm so happy that he is here. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank you, Ola. Maybe. Yeah, I'll just introduce you, Oleg, so everyone... I, may yeah. I ask you, may I ask yeah. you to give me possibilities to show my presentation from my computer? You, you should be able to share already. No, I have no uh, demonstration of the screen. May I ask you to give me... Uh, because, because I have no... In my yeah. computer now, this... You you don't see it? Yeah, no. Oleg, in the middle of your screen, there should be a green button on the bottom. Yes, yes, middle. but I yeah. have no such. You you must to give me such. Uh, you should have permission rights. now. We gave you permission, so if you can try it again. Give me permission. Yeah, you, you should. You should have it now. We gave it to you. Do you, do you see it now? No. Hmm. That's oh. um. because I I watch uh, this green button uh, when Ula spoke about, uh, but now I haven't it. Not Ula, but previous speaker. Yeah, no, it's it's um, a little bit weird because you are already co-host. So usually, when you are co-host, you can then share the screen. And I'm not really sure how we can solve this problem. Mm. You are sure you don't see it? Maybe um, you can. Maybe you can try to send it to me if you want. Really yes. No. Yes. Thing. Yes. I see. You have Just it. Just a moment. Okay. I already have it. One Wait. moment. In the meantime, maybe. Uh, uh, yeah, Oleg. Yes. You can see. Yeah. Yeah. Now we can see it. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much, Ula, because uh, she spoke about many uh, aspects which I wanted to spoke now. 
and uh, thank you uh, global women against nato for the chance to speak today with you because i think i think i think it is extremely important if russian uh, representative of the russian peace movement will be together with international peace movement and uh, i greet uh, you from the southern coast of the gulf of finland now i'm 70 kilometers from the russian estonian border mm -hmm. It is a line of the potential military confrontation between Russia and NATO. The largest nuclear cluster in the Baltic Sea, located here in my city, there are 18 uh, nuclear and radi uh, radiation hazards facilities here located. Um, now, NATO. NATO generals have published possible scenarios of the confrontation between uh, Russia and NATO in this area. One such scenario uh, describes uh, how the alliance armed force dismelt uh, the Russian military base in Kaliningrad. It is here. You can see, I show you. Ulla already mentioned Subalski Corridor. Oleg, I only see your have... first slide. You have to switch yeah. the slides. We just see the first page. I think you need to move. Maybe you can um, start the presentation mode and then we should be able to see it. Do you see my... We see only the first slide or maybe you can okay. try to close and reshare again. Usually. Uh, how, how it's possible? Just a moment. Yeah. Uh, uh, I will show you. Or maybe try to select the, the right slide on the left side. Uh -huh. Yeah, now we can see the map. Map, I, but I'd like to show another map. Mm -hmm. Just a moment. Now take your time. You can try with the little arrow also on the... Okay, now you see it? Exactly. Do you see? Do you yes. see now? Yeah. yeah? Exactly. Baltic Sea. You see Baltic Sea map? Yes. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, is it correct my understanding that you see Baltic Sea map? Yes, now it's uh, it's all right. Yeah. And uh, here it is Suwalski Corridor, you all are already mentioned. This is... The brown line, it is line of the confrontation between uh, Russia, Belarus, and NATO. And according to the plans which is published by NATO generals, um, uh, they published this scenario, which uh, in this scenario they uh, said that they will destroy the Russian Navy base in this area in Kaliningrad. And after that, um, the naval, naval forces of the Alliance uh, will block uh, the Russian Navy in the St. Petersburg area here. And I'm sure that the Russian generals and admirals have no less victories uh, scenarios in the events uh, of the potential conflict in the Baltic Sea region. Uh, Russian president uh, signed the document and uh, on the deployment of additional forces on the border of the possible conflict between Russia and NATO. Some of the uh, ships of the Russian fleet have been moved to the Ladoga Lake here. Uh, it is uh, about um, 200 kilometers from the border uh, with Finland and Estonia. And um, let's look at the uh, threat uh, of the possible military conflict in the Baltic Sea region. More than 30 nuclear power units plus temporary storage facilities for the spent nuclear fuel here. They contain 
totally in uh, the 30 nuclear units more than 100 tons of the reactive plutonium 239. The half-life of plutonium 239 is 24,000 years. It was practically absent, this element, uh, from the S before the beginning of the nuclear era. Uh, it did not participate uh, in the evolution of the life in our planet. So it is one of the most toxic substances on the Earth. I calculated that the Leningrad nuclear power plant, it is uh, here in the eastern part of the Baltic Sea region, in the, uh, this nuclear power plant alone produced approximately 1 billion lethal dose of the plutonium 239 over, the, over 50 years. This amount of plutonium is enough to destroy 10 times more people than currently live in nine countries uh, of the Baltic Sea region, including Russia. Um, uh, dear colleagues, you know that Zaporozhye and Chernobyl uh, nuclear power plants in Ukraine were captured by Russian military. There were terrorist attacks on the Russian infrastructure of the Leningrad nuclear power plant, Kursk nuclear power plant, and Kalinin nuclear power plant in Russia. This means that there is no longer a taboo against destruction or blackmail using nuclear power plants. So, I think if uh, we'll start a real military conflict between Russia and NATO in the Baltic Sea region, it will be total collapse of the traditional style of life of all people who live in this area. Some information military budget Russia and NATO. Russian military budget has increased three times since the start of the war in Ukraine. But it is approximately 10, 10 times less than the total budget of NATO countries. But this cannot be obstacle of the conflict between Russia and NATO. In my opinion, there is a Russian know-how how to counter NATO uh, a lower military budget. The first know-how is Chinese support. Now, uh, more than 20,000 Chinese citizens work on the southern coast of the Gulf of Finland near the border of Russia and Estonia. The line of the confrontation between uh, Russia and uh, NATO is only a few kilometers from this area where we have 20,000 Chinese citizens. Uh, I think uh, so the situation on the Estonian Chinese border is dangerous for the escalation of the global conflict. Uh, I mean, uh, I mean that uh, the if start uh, the real conflict, uh, China um, will be involved to this uh, conflict for the protection of the Chinese citizens. Uh, second know-how um, uh, from Russia, it's, it's, it is uh, from the Cold War time. I'd like to show you another map. Do you see another map? Rosatom country? Yes, yeah. Uh, during the Cold War, the Soviet Union created uh, a system, so-called closed nuclear uh, cities uh, that worked on the nuclear weapons. Uh, 
it is uh, it is uh, single nuclear industry cities. Later, this single nuclear industry cities with nuclear power plants were added to this system. Now, one percent of the Russian population live in these twenty nuclear cities. It is approximately 1.5 million of the Russian citizens. Residents of these cities receive salaries in two or three times higher than residents of the region uh, in which these cities are located. Now, this Rosatom country has all the all uh, what they necessary resources and from the national budget and uh, for the reproduction of the nuclear weapons. This city is uh, really not Russian under uh, not Russian government in control, but by a supervisor council of seven peoples appointed by the president of the Russian Federation. So we have such kind of the two cities inside Russia. It's two uh, countries inside Russia. Russia, it is big matryoshka, you know, the Russian souvenirs. And inside of this big uh, matryoshka, we have nuclear matryoshka is only 100 times less. And this uh, two countries separated. Thus, the Russia, um, uh, the use, the infrastructure of the Cold War uh, for the modernization uh, of the nuclear weapons, and uh, it is main basis for the confrontation um, of with NATO. Um, what can we do in this uh, situation? Now we have uh, cooperation with the regional legislators from St. Petersburg and the uh, Leningrad Oblast. The main common activities is we protect our uh, nature. Uh, the main strategy to act against dangerous, uh, environmental dangerous project. And we have uh, some progress in this process. And I'd like to say that modern civil society in our uh, in Russia uh, lives and works in very difficult conditions. I think uh, it can be compared to the life in the in a Nazi Nazi concentration camp during the Second World War. Opponent of the war in Ukraine in in Russia, I mean are in prison. Hundreds of thousands of young men left Russia to avoid uh, participate in the war in Ukraine. During the Cold War, uh, there was an iron curtain. Citizens of the Soviet Union could not communicate or travel to the Western countries. Today, politicians in the Western countries and Russia have created a double iron curtain. Uh, they are trying to make us an enemy. So uh, we cannot go to the Western countries from the Russia and Western countries have uh, very strong barriers for the visit to Russia. But I think we cannot be enemies. We are, we are particle of our common living planet S. Let's say together, stop the killing of the people of Ukraine in Russia and negotiation immediately, no NATO. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you, Oleg. Thank you so much for, for the presentation. Um, now, I think we have 14 minutes left. I would like to go into the question we have already in the chat, maybe. I'll just, I'm sorry. I just 
uh, read uh, them all and then maybe the speakers can uh, take the floor if they want to answer uh, some of them. And then I see that Marga has also her hand up and then we, we, can, we can come to this question as well. So the first one that I see is, did Nordic parliaments or citizens get integral insight into the DCAs? Then we have, does this bilateral treaty mean non-persecution of US citizens who have committed war crimes, etc., that Sweden is giving up the right to exercise the principle of universal jurisdiction, which is provided by international law? Uh, how concentrated is the ownership of the media in your respective country? I see Ulla has already answered briefly in the chat. And um, I think, yeah, I don't know if one of the speakers uh, wants to take the floor on one of these questions. I, Ola? Could you could you repeat the question? Of course, I can also resend it into the chat. Yeah. Can I speak? Uh, uh, yeah, we can. Yeah, you have a, another question for for the speaker or the comment. In the meantime, I'll just copy and paste the questions for for the speakers into the chat. <clears throat> Yeah, go ahead. Okay, my name is Margareta and I'm uh, from Sweden in the very south, Lund. Um, I have a question to Ulla in Finland, um, because right now in Sweden, we are trying to stop the this uh, uh, DCA treatment um, in, uh, and uh, the Swedish government, they, in order to uh, get legal, they uh, they are going to change 34 uh, laws, and uh, <clears throat> it seems like uh, they just think it's um, it's uh, uh, so easy to to uh, change those laws without any any. Um, uh, question and they they are planning to um, accept the DCA um, in uh, uh, in May or June. They haven't even told us exactly when it's uh, it, when it's going to uh, take part. And I I would like to know in Finland, um, do you also have? Um, a government that uh, is changing your laws without uh, any uh, legal uh, uh, would, uh, well well uh, any um legality yeah <laughs> that's my question to yeah. Earl in finland uh, because there are very similar um questions uh, between Sweden and Finland. We have just uh, become members of this NATO. So it would be interesting to know uh, how f the government in Finland is acting. Okay. First, an answer about the, the media. Um, it's totally in the hands in, in Finland of the political elite and, and, and in US. Uh, <laughs> hands and i think it's the same thing in in sweden um the whole thing how it was introduced the, the nato membership without any comments uh, any 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 critics nothing about the background to the ukraine war nothing no analysis nothing it was new to the finnish people or, or the finnish how shall we say uh, people who knows what is going on so the, the the they were captured. It was a coup. It was really a coup, mm -hmm. uh, and I think the situation is quite similar in the in the other Nordic countries. But actually, in Finland, this uh, both NATO and the DCA agreement goes so far into the so sovereignty that it should be a, a, a voting with three uh, fourth majority in the parliament. 
But even if we would get it, it doesn't matter because they would get it. They have 90% of the parliamentarians, 95, I would say. So whatever we do, uh, whatever we ask or whatever we require, they have the majority. And we don't even try to get a referendum because the referendum would be a bra bravo to the DCA. The Finnish people are completely Russophobic. In my own family, I cannot have a, 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 a conversation with my sister because she's absolutely, she, she thinks I'm crazy that I'm against NATO. So the situation is really delicate. And I, I'm glad that Karin said that in, in, in Sweden, the media has opened up. Yeah, they have opened up because the game is over. Now they can let us in so they can say, yeah, but we have a debate. We should have had it two years ago when it started, not now. Now it's too late. So the situation is really, really dangerous. And, and also, um, we have no means to do it otherwise than global cooperation. We have to show that we are an international movement. Uh, the, the, the few Finns that are against it, we are called uh, Putinists and, and whatever real bad words. So we have to stick together and do it together, all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Ulla. And Ingeborg, I see you, were, you also wanted to speak. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Going back to the media again, uh, also in Norway, it is a strong polarized situation uh, with an enormous propaganda. And uh, it, we are back to the George Bush uh, situation with the start of the war on terror, where either you are with us or you are against us. And the few that are against his master's voice, so to say, or the um, consensus uh, agreements of the academic, media, military, industrial complex are labeled uh, different bad, bad things. However, there is a short, a small opening now in the media, and I think it comes from the atrocities in Gaza, because so many people are following the Gaza, um, uh, the war in Gaza, and seeing the uh, Western double standards uh, playing out. So the media is understanding that they have to start with some. Uh, nuances uh, in this picture. However, the politicians remain um, totally um, silent on these issues. They continue with the strong Stoltenberg effect, saying that we have to make sure that Ukraine is winning in um, is winning the war. Otherwise, the Russian force will be all over. So um, what is a huge concern to, to many of us is that also the media is not presenting any solutions. They are not solution oriented at all. So the alternatives to war and the alternatives to, to, um, to militarism and the huge uh, NATO alliance are not presented openly uh, in our in which, um, work to do. And, and um, uh, there are ongoing seminars, ongoing um, actions to show that indeed uh, we don't need to continue this war rhetoric and um, war offensive, but can come up with other solutions oriented more towards building a, a cultural peace and non-violence. Thank you. Thank you, Ingeborg. Um, Oleg? Uh, dear colleagues, I'd like to add a little bit. Uh, of course, uh, the Russian mass media under the total uh, governmental control, and not governmental, but total president control. And uh, it is not possible to publish any alternative opinion and to act uh, with criticism of the uh, government and president. But at the same time, uh, 
uh, we have a vision of the legislator and the people from the Russian Academy of Science, which is the, not in Moscow, but close to the Baltic region. Uh, some times ago, we organized uh, the transnational webinars uh, with uh, American peace movement. And uh, we maybe remember Ingeborg, uh, we organized with Ingeborg um, some discussions. And uh, the participants of these international discussions was the not experts from the Moscow, not from the federal government, but from the Baltic Sea region, because these stakeholders have very different motivation uh, than the people uh, 1,000 kilometers from Moscow and from the far east, uh, from the Russian eastern part of the uh, Russia. So my idea, my message to you, reasonable if we will organize such kind of the uh, transnational webinars and if we will involve uh, non-government organizations peace movement activists environmental movement activists and the regional legislators from saint petersburg uh, legislative assembly from leningrad oblast legislative assembly it is seven million people live in this region so, so I think this is some perspective for the cooperation and for the promotion of our common vision in the Baltic Nordic region. Thank you. Thank you, Oleg. I, I would give the floor to Karin first, then Tove. Then I don't know if Sophie wants also to give maybe some final remarks and then I'm afraid we need to close today's session. But uh, Karin, please. Um, uh, our politicians have asked uh, the Swedish people to prepare for war, which is really fantastic. Uh, and now we have a chance to get into interesting discussions uh, about nuclear war cannot be won and it, it, it has got to be um, prevented. And we have to prevent wars and how do we prevent them? And my suggestion is to, to uh, learn and teach more about conflict resolution so that you see that you have to analyze the situation and uh, you have to uh, show and look at everybody's perspectives. And there are so many things to learn about the conflicts at the local level and you can you still need them at the global level but anyway we we can get into the media with more uh, intellectual discussions uh, thanks to them opening now when it's over as uh, Ulla rightly says so that's some hope we have we can't l lose hope we have to continue however it dark it looks so thank you for a uh, allowing me to be here thank you thank you karen for those yeah hopeful words and Tove. yes uh, i will say thank you for taking part in this discussion and i will mention that for denmark i think the situation is a little bit different from the other nordic country because uh, we have been a member of nato from the first day in 1949 and then at that time, we had an agreement with the United States. And uh, it was that they had to defend us um, under the Second World War. And therefore, they had an, a base in Tula in Greenland. And uh, this appointment was at the length 10 years. Then we could uh, loosen it up and uh, go out of this treatment. But when this 10 years uh, was... Uh, was gone, it was, we were unable to get out of this agreement because we were threatened with being thrown out of NATO at that, uh, at that time. And then we said, okay. So we had this experience that USA is the great brother and we can say no, but it is, doesn't matter to say no. 
it's one thing that uh, has a has a, a big um, impact in Denmark. Uh, the other thing is that um, our government are saying this: there will be no change in politics. It's only prolonged cooperation with USA. We are still um, uh, working together in this uh, SOFA agreement made in 1951. So they say there are no change. We are just building, building it out and um, supply with these bases on the Danish ground. So I have uh, I have uh, asked some of the questions in the in the chat about the media because it's just the same in Denmark as you have said in the the other Nordic country. Uh, it's very difficult to get out and uh, open the debate about the debates. We are trying to get out to the schools and gymnasium mm -hmm. and uh, um, other places to 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 inform, but. Um, but we we will try to to get this question about having a referendum just to open the debate to get it because we know we will get these bases but we don't want it to happen without any debate thank you thank you Dove. i was just wondering if sophie wanted to give some final remarks i don't see the the hand that's why i'm i'm asking if there's yeah. time I'll, you know i'll just say a couple of yeah, yeah please go ahead well i mean just firstly i just wanted to thank um you know the rest of the speakers like the um you know really really important and like, a huge amount of like information in there but like, i've just found it so useful so um sharing those presentations um i think would be really great because like there's just so much work and research that's gone into them that would be really really helpful um i suppose for me i just wanted to pick up this point around media and i think it had sort of been uh picked up a little bit um in the chat um by uh Chord bjork um which is like social media totally cuts through the um the censorship of the mainstream media um and it's uh, you know it's you being used to you know organize like protest movements across the world and certainly it's had a massive impact in terms of people understanding for instance seeing you know on their on their phones um exactly the horror of the genocidal war in gaza so you know politicians can you know lie or say whatever but people are actually getting that information sort of that's unmediated by these you know these few um you know powers so i think that that's very hopeful and it's very important um i think the other thing is you know the world is shifting massively isn't it you know we we know what's going on we know that the sort of the us its economic power is 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 really uh, you know on the decline and and you know and that we know that countries like china are um you know are much more powerful but also it's giving kind of a new opportunity for a new you know a new world order which isn't based on this like dominance of the of the us and that's you know that is a good thing <laughs> you know to to and so on the one hand we're having this m massively sort of more dangerous situation you know as like the us is preparing to sort of you know confront you know and use its nuclear weapons against russia and you know horrifically you know potentially against china but on the other hand you're seeing more and more countries being prepared to say i'm not going along with like this war drive you know i'm gonna sort of you know stand on the side of peace and for um you know for sort of global cooperation so you know it is it is very very terrible and dangerous but also there is there is a lot of hope there is a huge amount of hope and i think it's just remembering <laughs> that you know there is like millions of people out there and like now sort of like you know leaders of countries like that are very populous <laughs> that are that that um, are on our side and so to, to remember that and for us to keep going you know to keep going to keep organizing um because we're bringing more and more people with us so thank you
Thank you, Sophie. Voila, two words, then we need to close. <laughs> yeah, I, I really want to say that we should we should reach out to the countries outside NATO and, and not being under US dominance. As I listened to an interview with a South African foreign minister, a, a woman, uh, and it was absolutely great. And, and we have to see those glimpses of light. And also, if you think of the Pope, how many times he has been requiring uh, Ukraine uh, negotiations. Uh, so, and we have to send these messages out on all our uh, networks so that we get hope, because the situation is really totally black in our countries. But to reach out is, is really, and to spread the good words. And, and um, Positive statements, we need them. We need them. And I hope that many of you in some way can participate in the Washington uh, uh, um, events in July, either physically or on webinars. Thank you for having been here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ola. Thank you to all the speakers of being Ingeborg, Karin, Oleg. Uh, it has been a pleasure for, for us, for IPB, to host this event. and. Yeah, we will try to do also our job and spread the, the events and the news. You can always have a look on our website. We will be also in, in Washington. Yeah, my, my really final sentence uh, would be that what Ingeborg was saying, that militarism is a black hole of democracy, is true. But I also like to think that there is the civil society and we are the watchdog there. So. Uh, thank you all for your all the work that you are doing. Keep keep doing so and help us help everybody to achieve what we want. That's uh, yeah, peace via peaceful means. And thank you really so much for the patience and your time. I'm going to stop now the recording here. I want to say to Emily, thank you for a very wonderful moderating and thank you IPB for letting us have your space. Thank you of both course. Sean and, and Emily. Thank you.